He was loved by the French but hated by the British. He was seen as a revolutionary, an educationist, a human rights activist and a saviour, but others saw him as a tyrant, an oppressor, a coup plotter and the Hitler of his time. Napoleon Bonaparte was a charismatic leader whose words and actions brought life and hope, but the darker side of him also brought death and destruction. Napoleon was a bright chap who excelled in school and earned a scholarship to study at a military academy at Brienne de Chateau in France. While he was there, the young Napoleon was bullied and mocked for his inability to speak or write French properly, for his native tongue was Corsican. However, despite those early setbacks, Napoleon grew up to be one of the finest soldiers France had ever produced, and he went on to revolutionize the French army. Fast forward, he had his first taste of leadership in 1785 when he was commissioned second lieutenant in the 1st Artillery Regiment of the French Army. However, it wasn't until 1793 that the higher-ups in the French Army began to take notice of the young Napoleon, who by now was a senior gunner and artillery commander. During a battle with the British at Toulon, Napoleon devised a clever plan that helped the French to defeat the British. The plan included taking a strategic hill in the city that allowed them to rain several cannonballs and bullets on the British, forcing them to retreat. This clever strategy brought him to the attention of the army generals, and soon the 24-year-old Napoleon was promoted to brigadier general. Napoleon's war tactics influenced several modern military strategies, including the Schlieffen Plan that was birthed during the Ulm campaign in Central Europe in 1805. His strategy worked as he came out victorious and conquered much of Europe. His achievements were not limited to the battlefield as his ideas revamped the French economy and breathed life into their education system. Napoleon stabilized the French economy by establishing the Bank of France in 1800, which regulated paper money and was supported by a huge gold reserve. He also instituted a system of meritocracy where hard work, talent and ability were rewarded as opposed to the old system where friends and relatives were favoured to the detriment of the poor. Understanding the significance of education, Napoleon reformed France's education system and made sure that there was total obedience and loyalty to the king. However, for all his great deeds on and off the field for the French, anyone that wasn't French may regard him as perhaps anything but great. Napoleon's methodologies had a darker side that's often not spoken of. In October 1795, the Royalists wanted to bring back the old regime, also referred to as the Ancien Regime, and restore the Catholic Church to its former glory. Therefore, they staged an uprising against the National Convention which was ruling France at the time. Seeing the power and sheer numbers that the Royalists had, Paul Barras, a politician belonging to the National Convention, decided to fall on Napoleon for help. He had met Napoleon during the Battle of Toulon and had seen how the young lad dispersed the British army with ease. Therefore, he fell on Napoleon to deal with the royalists who threatened to cause mayhem in the city. Napoleon responded to Paul Barras' call and was immediately handed the improvised forces which had been put together to defend the National Convention at the Tuileries Palace in Paris. However, Napoleon was at a loss as to what tactic to use against the royalists as they had the numbers and appeared better organized than the forces at Tuileries Palace. He remembered the massacre that happened there three years ago when revolutionaries stormed the same palace and killed about 600 Swiss soldiers and his heart sank. But just then, an idea occurred to him. To disperse the royalists and break their morale, he decided to use grape shots, also known as canister shots. These were small iron balls packed into a canister with sawdust. When fired, the canister disintegrates and the iron balls spread out at great speeds, over 300 meters, cutting through enemy lines. Napoleon smiled at this idea and ordered his forces to retrieve a set of cannons and place them right at the entrance to the palace. When the royalists arrived, Napoleon waited till they got within range and then he gave the order and the grape shots were fired. The cannonballs fired at such proximity and did massive damage to the royalists, tearing the limbs of people from their bodies and cutting others in half. There were dismembered bodies everywhere, with the streets of Paris flowing with blood. About 1,400 royalists perished that day, and the rest took to their heels. His fame spread far and wide, and his name was on the lips of every French man, woman and child as they sang his praises for massacring the royalist insurgents. The National Convention rewarded him with vast wealth and promoted him to the commander of the interior. 
Filled with pride at his accomplishments, Napoleon embarked upon his first Italian campaign where he wreaked havoc on the forces of Piedmont and routed the vast army of the Austrians at the battles of Castiglione, Bassano, Arcole and Rivoli where he killed 14,000 Austrians. During the campaign, Napoleon Bonaparte took 150 prisoners, 170 flags and 540 cannons, but that was not all. He looted $45 million in funds and $12 million in jewellery and treasure, and his men robbed the Italians of 300 pieces of priceless paintings and sculptures. To expand and strengthen the empire's hold of the Mediterranean, Napoleon marched with 13,000 men to Damascus, modern-day Syria, and Galilee. There, Napoleon ravaged the towns along the coast, including Jaffa and Gaza, but the town that felt the worst of Napoleon's wrath was Jaffa. Before destroying Jaffa and its citizens, he sent two messengers, a trumpeter and an officer, to the governor of Jaffa, requesting that they surrender or face his full wrath. Ahmed al-Jazar, the governor of Jaffa, defiantly refused and instead beheaded Napoleon's messengers and had their heads displayed on the city's walls. The news of the death of Napoleon's messengers cut through his stomach and his face turned red with rage. He marched into the town with 13,000 men, killing everyone that dared to cross his path, including women and children. But the worst was yet to come. He permitted his men to slaughter and rape both men and women for two whole days, but that didn't satisfy his anger. Napoleon quickly learned that Ahmed al-Jazar, who managed to escape, had used prisoners of war to defend the city of Jaffa. Probably angered that al-Jazar tricked him, Napoleon brutally killed all the prisoners of war, either by shooting them, stabbing them with bayonets, or drowning them in the Mediterranean Sea. Back home, the French had suffered a series of defeats at the hands of a coalition of forces, including Britain, Russia, and Austria. Therefore, in August 1799, Napoleon left his army and set sail from Egypt to France to help his country. When he arrived, he realized that the ruling government was in disarray. He therefore took advantage and staged a coup d'etat in November of the same year. Supported by a politician named Emmanuel Joseph Sieyès, his brother Lucien Bonaparte, and Joseph Fouché, a statesman. When Napoleon rose to power, he realized that the French Republic was low on funds, and though he supported the abolition of slavery in 1794, he reinstated it in 1802. This didn't go down well with the slaves in Saint-Domingue, modern-day Haiti, and Guadalupe. The former slaves, not wanting to go back to a life of servitude, took up arms and fought the French armies, resulting in the deaths of thousands on both sides. Napoleon needed the slaves to build the French Empire, so he devised one of the most sinister ways to force and trigger fear in the now free slaves back into slavery. In French writer Claude Ribes' 2005 book titled Napoleon's Crimes, he asserts that Napoleon ordered his men to fill the lower decks of ships with sulfur and then lure the slaves into the ships. Once the slaves were on the ships, the hulls were sealed to prevent the slaves from escaping, then the sulfur was set ablaze, burning the slaves to their deaths in excruciating agony. According to Claude Ribes, this act of Napoleon served as the blueprint for Hitler's Holocaust. Though his expedition to the Mediterranean started well, things started going bad for Napoleon towards the tail end. An expedition that began with 13,000 soldiers saw 1,500 of them missing, 1,200 killed in action, and a huge chunk of his army stricken with the bubonic plague. Thus, Napoleon had no choice but to abandon his mission and retreat for the time being. However, his retreat was delayed by the soldiers who had contracted the plague. To speed up his retreat, and in order to save time, Napoleon wanted the sick soldiers killed by poisoning them with an overdose of opium, but Dr. Dejeunet advised against it. However, Napoleon left a vial of opium at the sides of the disease-stricken soldiers and encouraged them to take it before the enemy arrives to avoid potential torture and death by the enemy as a way of mercy killing. What happened next has become a subject of controversy. Some claim that between 30 and 580 soldiers took the opium overdose and died. Thus, Napoleon killed his own soldiers. Others, too, state that none took the opium and that the soldiers were alive when the enemy got there. Was it necessary? Some may argue that he did the right thing to relieve the slow and agonizing deaths, and some say that it wasn't right. However, news started making rounds in France of the evils that Napoleon committed in Jaffa, including killing his own men. Some French citizens defended his actions as the righteous thing to do to alleviate suffering for his soldiers, while others thought of it as barbaric, and thus he was not fit to rule. Napoleon's public image began to wane, and fearing that he may lose public support, he hatched a master plan. 
Napoleon commissioned a young painter called Antoine Jean Gros to follow the French army during its campaign and depict various battle scenes in his paintings. He tasked the young man to paint him, Napoleon, in a heroic and compassionate light, also as a way to dilute the negative rumors around him. This ensured that when people viewed the paintings, they didn't just see a brute warrior, but instead a moral, diplomatic, peacemaking leader. Thus, it can be said that Napoleon manipulated his public image through painting that was deliberately done to attract public sympathy and support for his cause. Later on, the artist Croix regretted his involvement in mixing his art with propaganda with such a drastic influence and became immensely dissatisfied at his accomplishments. And at the age of 64, he committed suicide by drowning in the Seine, a river in northern France. Though Napoleon was an outstanding military strategist, revolutionary, economist, and educator, his actions certainly aren't very black and white. He will forever remain the much-loved and also the much-hated hero of French history. But what do you think of Napoleon Bonaparte? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, and be sure to check out more videos from our Pages in History. Thanks for watching.